before we get started, we'd like to share a quick message from Dell. With one phone call, Dell's dedicated U.S.-based advisors can customize tech solutions, including PCs powered by Intel, tailored to your business. Call 877-BY-DELL to connect with a Dell advisor today. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Uh, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? <laughs> I've never known that. Delivered at TED conferences, conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. I'm Guy Raz. So most of us think we know ourselves pretty well, right? I'm sort of a hippie pacifist in terms of general persona. That we're good people. Well, <laughs> I'm an egg-heady scientist with a large beard and, like, Birkenstocks. Who make good choices. Give an air of equilibrium as much as possible. But do we really know who we are and why we act in certain ways? And... Do we have any control over that anyway? Um, nah. This is Robert Sapolsky. He's a professor of neuroscience at Stanford University. We have very different potentials and sort of tendencies for behavior lurking in us. And I think some of the most sort of surprising, shocking, appalling, wonderful, uh, cases of sort of human behavior is when one side of it suddenly comes out from a person who never ever expected that. At one extreme, you got the person who suddenly runs into the burning building. People running into the fire to save a trapped man. While everyone else is sort of being headless chickens, not knowing what to do. Wow, I never knew I had that in me. Oh, thank God. Everybody's out. Here he is. Is this him right here? Um, at the other extreme, you have people ranging from, like, the Abu Ghraib scandal. ...by pictures of Iraqi prisoners being abused by American soldiers. ...to, like, the famed Stanford prison experiment. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Where people turn out to do things never in their darkest moments would they have imagined they were capable of. I was dismayed that I could uh, act in a uh, manner so absolutely unaccustomed to anything I would even really dream of doing. We're capable of a lot of stuff. What is sort of human nature when it comes to these good and bad behaviors? And the answer is going to be, it depends when, where what you had for breakfast, what you had when you were a fetus in somebody's womb back when, what your culture has been, a little bit of what your genes are, how your brain is wired up. It depends. It depends enormously on context. So on the show today, we're going to explore a lot of that context. Ideas about whether we're hardwired, about what makes us who we are, and why we behave the way we do. How much of that is biological? How much of it is learned? And how much of it, if any, can we change? And as Robert Sapolsky points out, human nature and its whole spectrum of behaviors is complicated, even for the people who study it. Because despite his serene presence... I'm sort of calming enough that my students regularly nap during my lectures, so that must be a good index of that. Robert actually has a pretty violent recurring fantasy. Here's how he described it on the TED stage. The fantasy always runs something like this. I've overpowered his elite guard, burst into his secret bunker with my machine gun ready. He lunges for his Luger. I knock it out of his hand. He lunges for his cyanide pill. I knock that out of his hand. He snarls, comes at me with otherworldly strength. We grapple, we fight. I manage to pin him down and put on handcuffs. Adolf Hitler, I say, I arrest you for crimes against humanity. Here's where the Medal of Honor version of the fantasy ends and the imagery darkens. What would I do if I had Hitler? And it's not hard to imagine once I allow myself. 
sever his spine at the neck, take out his eyes with a blunt instrument, puncture his eardrums, cut out his tongue, leave him alive on a respirator tube fed, not able to speak or move or see or hear, just to feel. And then inject him with something cancerous that's going to fester and postulate until every cell in his body is screaming in agony, until every second feels like an eternity in hell. That's what I would do to Hitler. Wow, Robert, you're, you've got like this violent streak. I mean, you, you're supposed to be this hippie pacifist, and then you have this, this very vivid fantasy. Well, yeah. I've had that one since I was little. A remarkable number of people have now told me that they've had ones along similar lines. Huh. And I'm this person who, like, is far from being violent as possible, yet I harbor these thoughts, yet I'm opposed to the death penalty, yet there's some people I would certainly like to see removed from the planet. And I, like, I like violent movies, but I'm for strict gun control. You know, we're all a confusing mixture of a whole array of impulses and the biology underlying the fact that some of those impulses come to the forefront in some circumstances and the others, you know, in other contexts is this huge challenge biologically. Our nature is to be context dependent on our behavior. So how do you make sense of the biology of our best behaviors, our worst ones, and all of those ambiguously in between? The challenge is to understand the biology of the context of our behaviors, and that's real tough. One thing that's clear, though, is you're not going to get anywhere if you think there's going to be the brain region or the hormone or the gene or the childhood experience or the evolutionary mechanism that explains everything. Instead, every bit of behavior has multiple levels of causality. But to understand that, we have to step back a little bit. What was going on in the environment seconds to minutes before? Hours to days before? Back years, back, for example, to your adolescence. Even further back to childhood, back to when you were just a fetus, back to when all you were a collection of genes. Back centuries, what were your ancestors up to? Back millions of years. Because if we're talking about genes, implicitly, we're now talking about the evolution of genes. Basically, what we're seeing here is, if you want to understand a behavior, whether it's an appalling one, a wondrous one, or confusedly in between, if you want to understand that, you've got to take into account what happened a second before to a million years before, everything in between. Okay, so if we're just the sum of all these parts, what do, what do we actually control? Well, just to really take us into <laughs> potentially not touch with the 10 foot pole territory, <laughs> my personal <laughs> bias is we've got no agency at all. Um, I don't think there's a shred of free will out there from spending my decades thinking about behavior and the biological influences on it. I'm convinced by now free will is what we call the biology that hasn't been discovered yet. It's just another way of stating that we're biological organisms determined by the physical laws of the universe. So everything that you're saying here now and everything that I'm saying to you now and the things I'm going to do for the rest of the day and that you're going to do for the rest of the day and the interactions you're going to have and, and I'm going to have, we have very little say in that? Actually, remarkably little sort of conscious access to it. An awful lot of the time, say, if we choose a behavior, it turns out there was some subterranean emotional tumult that led to that. For example, when you put people in positions of making moral judgments about behavior, you see, for example, more emotional parts of the brain activate sooner than the cortical parts. I mean, one study that just floors me in that regard um, was carried out in Israel. All of the judges in Israel hearing parole board 
uh, hearings over the course of a year, something like 5,000 cases, and them looking at who got granted parole, who got sent back to jail, looking at all sorts of variables. And the strongest predictor of judges' decisions was how many hours it had been since they'd eaten a meal. Wow. Which is boggling, except it's not. Because there's a biology that explains it. And they're not going to say, because I'm hypoglycemic right now and it's hard to feel empathic for it. They're going to quote some philosopher they had to read in law school or whatever they're going to assume and fill in the void with sort of pretenses of pure agency. You know, with every passing year, as we learn more and more about every one of these domains and what it has to do with behavior, the things where we used to say, ah, that's volitional, ah, that's him and what he chooses or chooses not to do, more and more of that keeps falling by the roadside as we say, aha, no, actually, it turns out that's a psychiatric disorder Mm. with these genetic components. Mm. Ah, for example, this is not a child who is lazy and unmotivated. There's little micro abnormalities in that kid's cortex producing learning deficits. And, you know, when you look at the space that free will has been getting crammed into more and more so with each passing year of insights into the biology of behavior, got to say, it's going to get really, really crammed in or non-existent at some point. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, I realize I have absolutely no idea how somebody is supposed to really believe that stuff. Intellectually, I believe there's no free will, but I still have absolutely no idea how to get around Mm -hmm. complimenting somebody on like their new (laughs) hairdo or or being pleased if somebody says something complimentary to me. Or like a charitable thing that they did. You would say, hey, that was so great. Yeah. This is, this is, this is so complex. And what's amazing about it is that, I mean, you, (laughs) you acknowledge that there are things about this that even you don't understand. Oh, yeah. And worse is there's things about it that I understand, which nonetheless, I have no idea how to incorporate into behavior. Hmm. So, I mean, can we move past our biology? Nah. (laughs) That's all there is. For better or worse, and everything in between, there's no little homunculus sitting on our brains there that's inside the brain but not made of brain yuck and instead is made of like gumption and backbone and Calvinist self-discipline. It's biology all the way down. There's not a separate thing. We are the sum of all of that. Robert Sapolsky, he's a professor of neuroscience at Stanford University. You can see his full talk at TED.com. On the show today, hardwired, and in a moment, a different take on whether we can change our biology. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First, to Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to automatically calculate and print the correct amount of postage for every letter or package you send. You'll have all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right at your fingertips. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer. Sign up for Stamps.com for a special offer, a four-week trial plus postage, and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone, and enter NPR. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Thanks also to Bombas. When you think socks, think Bombas. Made from premium cotton, Bombas stays warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And every pair comes with a built-in blister tab, innovative arch support, stay-up technology, and a seamless toe. With many colors, patterns, lengths, and styles, Bombas look and feel great wherever you go. And for every purchase you make, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. Get 20% off your first purchase at bombas.com slash radio hour. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. 
And on the show today, hardwired. Ideas about what determines our personalities, our traits, our behaviors, and even the choices we make. And usually when we talk about the way humans are wired, we're talking about our genetics, our DNA. Everything we do is so-called encoded in our DNA. And it comes after millions and millions of years of evolution. And that defines essentially a lot of our lives, our future lives. This is Moshe Schiff. He's a professor at McGill University. And, and you're an epigeneticist, right? Yes. What is it, by the way? The field of epigenetics is interested in how uh, genes are programmed. Hmm. So if you think about our genes as some sort of a hardware of a computer, uh, epigenetics is a software. Uh, it makes it work, right? If you buy a computer that has only hardware without software, it's useless. Basically, Moshe tries to understand whether the DNA we inherit is fixed or whether it can change. Right. So this is the big, big uh, discussion of our century. And the idea was very dominant that most of who we are is defined by the kind of genes we inherited from our ancestors. You can look at it as it gives you freedom because it makes no difference what you'll do. If you have a gene that you're going to be smart, you'll be smart. And if you're not, don't waste your time studying. Uh, some people believe that they are genes that make us rich, make us anxious or not anxious. So that was the general idea. But as genetic research advanced, there was a good conviction among some people that there must be something else going on in DNA. The DNA by itself is not sufficient to explain behavior. And Moshe has been studying this idea for decades, starting with some groundbreaking experiments with rats. Moshe Schiff tells the story from the TED stage. So it all came to life in a dark bar in Madrid. I encountered my colleague from McGill, Michael Meany. And we were drinking a few beers. And like scientists do, he told me about his work. And he told me that he is interested in how mother rats lick their pups after they were born. And I was sitting there and saying, this is where my tax dollars are wasted, <laughs> on this kind of soft science. And he started telling me that when the rats, like humans, lick their pups in very different ways, some mothers do a lot of that, some mothers do very little, and most are in between. But what's interesting about it is that when he follows these Pups, when they become adults, like years in human life, long after their mother died, they are completely different animals. The animals that were licked and groomed heavily are not stressed. They have different sexual behavior. They have different way of living than those that were not treated as intensively by her mother. So then I was thinking to myself, is this magic? How does this work? As geneticists would like you to think, perhaps the mother had the bad mother gene that caused her pups to be stressful, and then it was passed from generation to generation. It's all determined by genetics. Or is it possible that something else is going on here? So in rats, we can ask this question and answer it. So what we did is a cross-fostering experiment. You essentially separate the litter, the babies of this rat at birth, to two kinds of fostering mothers. Not the real mothers, but mothers that will take care of them. High-licking mothers and low-licking mothers. And the remarkable answer was, it wasn't important what the gene you got from your mother. It was not the biological mother that defined this property of these rats. It is the mother that took care of the pups. So how can this work? Is it possible that the mother is somehow reprogramming the gene of her offspring through her behavior? And we spent 10 years, and we found that there is a cascade of biochemical events 
by which the licking and grooming of the mother, the care of the mother, is translated to biochemical signals that go into the nucleus and into the DNA and program it differently. So now the animal can prepare itself for life. First of all, we don't think of rats being uh, particularly maternal, but 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 I guess they, they, they are. I guess they can be. They are. And if you watch rats... No, thank you. <laughs> you can see that they, they lick, they groom, and the results are very clear that it's not the biological mother that is important. In this case, it is the fostering mother. It's the experience. Yes. So it was very clear around 20 years ago that DNA has two identities an inherited identity, and another identity that is formed during embryogenesis or during the time the fetus develops in the womb of the mother. Of course, the next question was, does it end there? Hmm. And that is, does DNA have a third identity, which I call it experiential identity, the identity of past experiences that somehow also use the same kind of biochemical concepts to give DNA different identities. But in this time, this will be an identity of an experience. But is it true only for rats? The problem is we cannot test this in humans because ethically we cannot administer child adversity in a random way. So if a poor child develops a certain property, we don't know whether this is caused by poverty or whether poor people have bad genes. So geneticists would try to tell you that poor people are poor because their genes made them poor. Epigeneticists will tell you poor people are in a bad environment or an impoverished environment that creates that phenotype, that property. So we can't do experiments, we can't administer adversity to humans, but God does experiments with humans, and it's called natural disasters. So one of the natural disasters, the hardest natural disaster in Canadian history happened in my province of Quebec. It's the ice storm of 1998. We lost our entire electrical grid because of an ice storm when the temperatures were in the dead of winter of Quebec, minus 20 to minus 30, and there were pregnant mothers during that time. And my colleague Suzanne King followed the children of these mothers for 15 years. And what happened was that as the stress increased, and here we had objective measures of stress, how long you were without power, where did you spend your time, was it in your mother's-in-law apartment or in some uh, posh uh, country home. So all these added up to a social stress scale. And you can ask the question, how did the children look like? And it appears that as stress increases, the children develop more autism, they develop more metabolic diseases, and they develop more autoimmune diseases. So the the mothers passed on the stress factor to the babies? Yes. So we looked at the DNA, you know, when the kids were 15 years old. DNA in the blood, in the immune system. And we saw many, many differences in the way the epigenetics was programmed. So this, in my opinion, was, you know, one of the first evidence that in humans too, an experience can result in long-term changes to the way genes are program. So th- this would suggest that we are prone to constant change based on our environment, or, or, or am I wrong? No, no, you're absolutely right. So on one hand, a, we have an old genome, right? It's uh, millions of years old. That's fixed. On the other hand, we have a changing world that is talking to our DNA. And this balance probably was selected by many, many millions of years of evolution. Yeah to provide with us with this amazing, what we call plasticity on one hand, and fixed characters on the other hand, right? So we need both. We need the immutable and immutable operating together. And that's the amazing paradox and challenge of, of life. DNA is not just a sequence of letters. It's not just a script. DNA is a dynamic movie. Our experiences are being written into this movie, which is interactive. You're like watching a movie of your life with the DNA, with your remote control. You can remove an actor and add an actor. And this has a tremendous optimistic message for ability to now encounter some of the deadly diseases like cancer, mental health, 
with new approach, we can epigenetically intervene, reverse the movie by removing an actor and setting up a new narrative. You know, Moshe, we were talking with Robert Sapolsky earlier, and he kind of questions how much free will we, we actually have. But, I mean, but if you say DNA is like a, like a dynamic movie, I mean, it seems like you could also make the argument that we actually do have some agency over who we are. Absolutely. And, and I think the word agency is extremely important. And the question is, who has agency, right? Is it you as an individual? Is it you as a family? Is it you as a community? Is it you as a country? Is it you as a world? And I think all of the above. So agency is now split. It's not just you. The agency is the interactions between all these elements. If this is true, and I believe it is, there is a lot of hope. If you look at it, look at humans, what they have done in the last hundred years. We have doubled lifespan, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's the well-being. I think it has to do with much lower levels of adversity, in, at least in some parts of the world, that humans were used to for thousands of years, right? We know our next meal is there. And that knowledge, you know, removes a tremendous amount of stress from our lives. Mm. Of course, you can always argue that it, all of this was pre-wired, like the script was pre-written, including those changes. But I think that there is, between the hard wiring and the ultimate result, there is a space where freedom of will is operating. And it's operating on those epigenetic processes. If we understand these processes, tap into these processes, we can be ruler over our genes by providing the right environments. And that's where we as societies have a responsibility. Moshe Schiff is an epigeneticist at McGill University. You can find his full talk at TED.com. So if Moshe Schiff is right, that positive experiences can rewrite DNA and improve health, what about negative experiences? Well, about 10 years ago, a pediatrician named Nadine Burke Harris was asking herself that very same question. In the back of my mind, I always thought, like, I wonder if stress hormones are affecting the health of my patients. Like, I wonder if that's even possible. Back then, Nadine had just finished her medical training at Stanford. That's right. Um, I started a clinic, a pediatric clinic in, in Bayview Hunters Point, which is one of San Francisco's most low-income and underserved neighborhoods. And as soon as Nadine opened that clinic, she started to notice something. A lot of kids were being referred to me by teachers, by principals, by school counselors for ADHD. It was a lot. Like, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't like two or three. It was a lot. And then she noticed another thing that, at first, seemed totally unrelated. One of her patients came in with asthma. I asked, what could it be that could be setting off, you know, your daughter's asthma? Could it be, you know, pet dander? Could it be pollen? Like, when do you notice that her asthma flares up? And this mom said to me, you know, doctora, I noticed that her asthma tends to get worse when her dad punches a hole in the wall. And hearing that convinced Nadine to start asking all of her patients about what was happening at home. So I had all of these patients who had these symptoms of ADHD, asthma, eczema, you know, skin rashes, right? But who also had severe histories of adversity. You know, violence in the community, violence at home, parents who were either mentally ill or substance dependent or incarcerated. What I observed, and I just started to notice this pattern, was that my patients who had the worst symptoms were also the ones who had the worst histories of adversity. So you, so you start to think that, that this adversity, this trauma, is, is potentially affecting their, their physical health. Yes. But this was a hunch at the beginning, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's like that voice at the back of your mind saying, huh. So what did you do? Well, one day, my colleague, Dr. Whitney Clark, 
walked into my office and he said, have you seen this? And he was holding in his hand a research paper called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And it was like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. Yeah. Because what it said was childhood adversity in and of itself is a risk factor for major health problems. The study seemed to confirm what Nadine had suspected all along, that adversity could rewire a child's brain and body. Nadine Burkaris picks up the story from the TED stage. That day changed my clinical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC. And together, they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Some people looked at this data and they said, come on, you know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are gonna ruin your health. This isn't science, this is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. In just a moment, Nadine Burke-Harris explains how childhood adversity can rewrite a child's DNA. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone, just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First to WordPress. Creating your website on WordPress.com helps your customers find you, remember you, and connect with you. At WordPress.com, you'll find hundreds of beautiful designs, the ability to add a custom domain name, and features to make your business more visible online using the technology that powers 28% of all websites. Get 15% off your new website today at WordPress.com slash radio hour. Thanks also to Discover. Discover alerts you if they find your social security number on any one of thousands of risky websites. Discover believes there are some things that you just need to know. It's just another way Discover looks out for you, not just your account. And best of all, social security alerts are free for Discover card members. All you have to do is sign up online. Learn more at discover.com slash free alerts. Limitations apply. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, Hardwired. Ideas about how our biology and our experiences determine who we are. And before the break, 
Pediatrician Nadine Burke Harris was explaining that childhood adversity is one kind of experience that can result in severe health problems. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful if you're in a forest and there's a bear. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Wow. So, I mean, that child then exhibits certain behaviors based on that exposure, I guess, right? That's exactly right. Probably, I would say, behavior is the canary in the coal mine. So some kids demonstrate behavioral symptoms and, as adults, more likely to suffer from depression, attempt suicide, have problems in the workplace, become incarcerated. But some kids don't show any behavioral symptoms. Hmm. Some kids just get sick all the time. Rashes or asthma or autoimmune disease, right, where your immune system attacks your own body, mm. right? And then they're more likely to be sick adults. Heart disease and arthritis and cancer and strokes and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and Alzheimer's. I mean, the kids that you have seen, right, is, is there any hope? I mean, is it reversible? Is, is, there, is there any way to, to deal with that? Yeah, so the good news is yes. Now that we know that your environment has such a profound effect on your biology, one of the most important things that we can do is early detection. So in San Francisco, we created the Center for Youth Wellness to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. We started simply with routine screening of every one of our kids at their regular physical. For our patients who do screen positive, we have a multidisciplinary treatment team that works to reduce the dose of adversity and treat symptoms using best practices, including home visits, care coordination, mental health care, nutrition, holistic interventions, and yes, medication when necessary. But we also educate parents about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress the same way you would for covering electrical outlets or lead poisoning. I mean, I mean, this is incredible. 
because what you're saying is with with the right intervention, you can prevent and and even sometimes reverse these these huge health problems. Yeah. And here's what's awesome is that we're seeing that it works. I literally last week had a follow up appointment with a patient who was a young girl who had experienced seven out of the 10 adverse childhood experiences. And this child had stopped growing. She had a diagnosis of failure to thrive. And we implemented some of the things that we know to be best practices. We did a, an intervention called child parent psychotherapy. But a big part of it was just educating mom about how the child's exposure to adversity was affecting her health. And I will tell you, she's back on the growth curve. This family's doing amazing. Hmm. We can reverse the effects of stress hormones if we detect it early enough. And those things will change their biology. Nadine Burke Harris is a pediatrician and the founder and CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco. You can see her full talk at TED.com. So how would you uh, how would you describe your, your personality? Oh, goodness me. Um, my personality is, I guess, fairly complex. This is Brian Little. I'm a research professor in psychology at uh, the University of Cambridge. And Brian does a lot of research on why we have the personalities we do, how much is hardwired and how much can be changed. Uh, there are neurophysiological differences. There's a genetic component. But it also has what I call a sociogenic um, origin in that cultures will provide the codes for how to act extrovertedly uh, or agreeably or neurotically. And then uh, we uh, shape our behavior to um, be consistent with those expectations. Brian laid out how he classifies different personalities on the TED stage. One of the most influential approaches in personality science is known as trait psychology, and it aligns you along five dimensions, which are normally distributed, that describe universally held aspects of difference between people. Uh, they spell out the acronym OCEAN. So O stands for open to experience versus those who are more closed. C stands for conscientiousness, in contrast to those with a more lackadaisical approach to life. E extroversion, in contrast to more introverted people. A, agreeable individuals, in contrast to those decidedly not agreeable. And N, neurotic individuals, in contrast to those who are more stable. All of these dimensions have implications for our well-being, for how our life goes. Let me deal in a bit more detail with extroversion because it's consequential and it's intriguing. Extroverts, when they interact, want to have lots of social encounter punctuated by closeness. They like to stand close for comfortable communication. They like to have a lot of eye contact or mutual gaze. Um, we found in some research that they use more diminutive terms when they meet somebody. So when an extrovert meets uh, Charles, it rapidly becomes Charlie and then Chuck, and then Chuckles baby. <laughs> Whereas for introverts, it remains Charles until he is given a pass to be more intimate um, by the person he's talking to. We speak differently. Extroverts prefer black and white, concrete, simple language. Introverts prefer, and I must tell you that I am as extreme an introvert as you could possibly imagine. We speak differently. We prefer contextually complex, contingent, weasel word sentences, <laughs> uh, more or less, <laughs> as it were. Not to put too fine a point upon it, like that. How, how much of, of, of these characteristics are wired into us? Uh, are we just born with some of these? Yeah, that is being very keenly debated right now. 
My own take on it is that the literature is pretty convincing, that there is a genetic component to personality traits. I was asked once, are, are people set like plaster? As had been argued early on about people by the age of 30, their traits are set like plaster. And I sort of jokingly say with a, with a British accent, no, but I think they're half plaster. <laughs> and um, that may be seen as somewhat flippant, but I think there's a kernel of truth to it that there is a degree of fixedness to traits. Um, they're manifested, if you wish, in temperament and early age and so on. I mean, I mean, this all makes intuitive sense, right? Like I look at my kids and, and I see in them personality traits that come from me and sometimes mm -hmm. traits that I don't necessarily like about myself. And, and, <laughs> and you see it, we see it in our kids. Yeah. It's a little daunting, isn't it? When yeah, you see it's, it in, it's in the kids. I mean, th I mean, that's the that's the thing, right? Like, <laughs> it it's a little bit scary because if there are things that you don't like about yourself, yeah, you some of those are just are they immutable? No, no, uh, th that I would say. I do not think that they are immutable. Um, we're wonderfully complex creatures, and I think that part of the delight of our complexity is that we're not as predictable as we might be. Yeah. And, and we act out of character. And so those aspects of the expression of traits seem to me to be really important. And mm -hmm. it takes us away from the notion that once you've got your personality fixed, that's it. You can't change. I think you can. Uh, and indeed, over the lifespan, uh, the research evidence is pretty clear that people will, will change as a group. As they get older, they um, will become less neurotic. They'll be more conscientious, more agreeable, and, and so on. But if you go back to your grade six reunion, uh, the rank order of people on these different dimensions stays relatively the same. The, the, uh, the kid who was the class clown may have a little more sophisticated sense of humor now that he's 36, uh, but he's still the one cracking the jokes. Yeah. Um, I see traits as being um, having sort of two boxes in, in the model. One are relatively fixed traits, which have a, a biogenic root, um, and then what I call free traits, which are more modulable and are much more likely to not reflect the biogenic, but some other aspects of um, the roots of our personalities. What are these free traits? They're where we enact a script in order to advance a core project in our lives. And they are what matters. Don't ask people what type you are. Ask them, what are your core projects in your life? And we enact those free traits. I'm an introvert, but I have a core project, which is to profess. I'm a professor. And I adore my students, and I adore my field. And so I act in an extroverted way, because at 8 in the morning, the students need a little bit of humor, a little bit of engagement to keep them going in arduous days of study. But we need to be very careful when we act protractedly out of character. Sometimes we may find that we don't take care of ourselves. I find, for example, after a period of pseudo-extroverted behavior, I need to repair somewhere on my own. I sometimes go to the men's room to escape the slings and arrows of outrageous extroverts. <laughs> I remember one particular day when I was retired to a cubicle trying to avoid overstimulation. And uh, a real extrovert came in beside me, and I could hear various evacuatory noises, which we hate, even our own. That's why we flush during as well as after. <laughs> and then I, then I heard this gravelly voice saying, hey, is that Dr. Little? <laughs> if anything is guaranteed to constipate, an introvert for six months is talking on the john. This is, Brian, this is like a question that you would ask God, and you're the closest that we have to God <laughs> here for God today. God help us. So, um, so you're going to have to stand in for God. Um, but I mean, you know, we, we've heard from Robert Sapolsky about, about how our behaviors are essentially determined, right, by, by genetics and, and environment. And and how we can also change our behavior from, from Moshe Schiff. So w what is it? Like, what is it that makes us who we are? 
Now hear this. <laughs> I think it is our personality, but only our personality if it is construed as the pursuit of projects that matter to us in our life. We're foolish if we try to say we're either completely free to chart paths irrespective of the um, traits that we were born with on the one hand or, or the opposite. I think that there are three things that are important here. One is the biogenic authenticity of our lives where you're able to do things that come naturally to you. Yeah. The second is what I call sociogenic authenticity where you're doing things that matter to your culture and you can do no other. And the third is what I call idiogenic, it comes from the same root as idiosyncrasy. And these are the personal things that you have crafted for yourself. And they may stand in conflict with both your your biogenic nature and your sociogenic nature. Mm. And it is that um, that gives us our signature singularity. This isn't putting in a plea for snowflakishness. Um, <laughs> this is a plea for recognizing that we are all like all, some, and no other person. Fascinating individual differences make us um, distinctive, indeed unique. That's psychologist Brian Little. He's written a book about this. It's called, Who Are You Really? The Surprising Puzzle of Personality. You can hear his full talk at TED.com. What? 